There was nothing special that was laid on for us by way of recreation or pastimes in our streets. When school was over, we children joined together and played our games, that was all. We made no distinction between boys and girls. We played together as if we were all the same. There were a few games that we played most frequently. Two or three boys would play at being Niker. The rest of us would call them, Aya, Aya and pretend to be their Paneo. These boys would act as if they had a lot of power over us. They'd call us names, humiliate us, and make us do a lot of work. We'd pretend to work in the fields all day, and then collect our wages and go home. We also played at keeping shop. The boys managed the shops, pretending to be the Nader Mutalali. We'd go there, hand over our tile money, and buy all sorts of groceries to take home. Tile money was made of broken shards of mud pots which we shaped into round pieces. Sometimes we'd go to the lake and bring some clay which we shaped into pots and pans and dolls to play with. There. 5. were other good games too. We'd play at giving circus shows or kotha performances, sometimes we danced or did a kami. Sometimes we played at being nuns and priests who came and gave us blows. Then we played at being married and setting off on a bus journey, the husband coming home drunk and hitting his wife, the police arriving and beating him up. But these were the games that we played only as very small children. As we grew a little older, then the games changed accordingly. As older children, we went together to the lake or the well to catch fish. Sometimes we went with the boys to collect up the wild manjanathi and kaduka fruit which they threw down from the trees, we ate the fruit they gave us, we wandered about with them. Then the older girls would play dice games, or hop and catch, or other indoor games with tamarind seeds and pebbles, and board games like palanguzi, thata angle. The boys too had their own games. Catching games, games with sticks, spinning tops, marbles. And then we played kabaddi as well. After we returned from the church in the evening, sometimes we played late into the night before going home to sleep. Those who had baby brothers and sisters would lull them to sleep on their shoulders and join in the game of carrying Petromax lamps in procession. We'd make toy chariots out of dried maize sticks and carry them around in procession, a few of us walking ahead, the others following on with the Petromax lamps. We used to make drums out of cattle membrane and skin, and bang them as we went along. It used to be such fun. We marched along, street by street. At last we'd come back to the shrine of St. Sebastian, and put down the chariot there. You should have watched the fun, as we went past our own houses. We'd each have a sly smirk on our faces then. Some of the older people would laugh at us and tease us. Others would follow us, ranting and raving away. Of course it was. To be expected they'd scold us when we went through the entire street, shouting and banging like that. Children from other communities would walk along the lake shore, all dolled up on their way to the cinema. But the rules of the village ensured that none of the women from our community went to the cinema. They said that this was because the boys of all the other communities would pull our women about if they were seen in the cinema hall. Then there would be fights all around. So, anyway, only our men went. And mostly it was only the younger fellows who went to the cinema. When we girls grew up, there was no more play. We went to work during the day, came home, and saw to the household chores, that was it. There was nothing else. Now even the little ones don't play anymore. Even the tiny ones wake up at cockcrow, go to the matchbox factory, and work there till sunset. As if the idea had suddenly hit them, the men of the village would play at Salambam. For this, they had long staffs with which they would fence. I didn't understand anything about it. All the same, when Salambam matches took place in front of the community hall, I'd be the first person to go and stand. There as a spectator. In the same way, the young man would also get together for a kabaddi game. That used to be really exciting. Lots of people from our street would go and watch. The men sometimes played cards sitting under the trees. They gambled for money and sometimes came to blows. But if the police turned up suddenly, they'd run for it, not even caring if their vestas fell off and vanished from sight. Near the community hall, there was a great ball-like stone. People called it the youth stone. It seems that in the evenings, young men would lift it high into the air and throw it down to the ground. It seems it was a way of demonstrating their strength. In the old days, there used to be jallikadu or bull chasing during the pongal season. Now it's been banned. Nobody runs a jallikadu anymore. At Christmas and Easter times there would be kabaddi matches in the village. Sometimes the match would be between teams of boys, all of whom were from our streets. Otherwise it would be between our boys. And the boys from the next village, there would be crowds. Bustling about at such times. Apart from all this on Christmas and Easter days, they would set up radios and mic sets. It was only much later that I realized that what we were calling radios were actually loudspeakers. In those days, nobody in our village had this kind of equipment. They used to have to borrow it all from the next village. As soon as the man with the mic set arrived at our bus stand, that was it. All the small children ran to the bus stand and accompanied him back to our streets. Our boys would help by carrying the radio themselves. Even as they came along, they would put their mouths to the speaker and say hello, hello, and such like. I too longed to touch it as the boys did, to try speaking into it. But I never once got the chance to do it. After they had brought the equipment and set it up, the first thing they did was to play the song, Ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you, seek and ye shall find. As soon as they heard the sound, all the little children from the houses nearby would come running up to 
The raised day is like little mice. We'd show our happiness by racing up the steps and jumping down from there. If we were in a high state of excitement, we'd push each other off onto the ground, fall on top of each other, roll about and get up in delight. After a while, we'd go home to put on our new clothes, slick down our hair with oil, plate it and put flowers in it, spit into the hard pot of powder, scrape it together to make a paste to dot the forehead, and then return to the dais in the community hall. Now we'd finger each other's new clothes in turn and talk endlessly about them, sharing our happiness. If this was the case among the little ones, the older women went about laughing amongst themselves in their own way. You could make out their joy even in the way they drew the water from the well opposite the hall, in their firm tread, water pots at their hips. As for the lads, they put on their new trousers, flapping. Loose in some cases, skin tight in others, sleek down there. Hair in all kinds of styles, and walked about, touching their hair now and then and smiling in a certain way. Some boys would wear shining white vestas down to their feet, and long shirts over red banyan vests. Everywhere you could see different colors. On feast days, they would build canopies in front of the shrines in the street, with banana trees tied to either side. We'd hold on to the canopy posts and twirl about in play. Sometimes the posts would shake and come loose when we did this. Women would come to place lighted candles at the shrines and to worship. Those candles were actually quite handy for small boys to light their biddies. They'd pick up the bitty stubs that old men had thrown away, light them up and smoke in secret. Sometimes, we girls would watch for fun. But if there was an argument, we'd threaten to tell their mothers we'd seen them smoke bitty stubs. As soon as the mic set arrived in the village, the boys would want to speak into it as they pleased, one after another. They'd sing songs. Some others would beat out the rhythm. Appropriately. They'd call out to each other, loudly, to come. And sing. Sometimes it would all end in a wrangle. In the past, there used to be a man in our parts, called Yudin, Blower. I don't know what his real name was. There wasn't a single person in the village who didn't know him. Because every day he'd drag his wife by the hair to the community hall, and beat her up as if she were an animal, with his belt. Everyone came to watch. But nobody could go near and separate them. Every day, for some reason or another, there would be a quarrel between them. It always came to blows. It seems when these two were getting married, just before the tali tying, the priest asked Yudin, Are you willing to take this woman for your wife? And Yudin, present there as the bridegroom, mind you, answered loudly, No, I'm not willing, Sami. At once the girl's father and uncles threatened and intimidated Yudin and forced him to agree, the tali tying took place only after that. People used to say that it was because he was forced into marrying a woman he didn't like. That he beat her like that every day. Anyway, this Yudin knew how to play the flute really well. He would play on a bamboo pulangus hole really beautifully. Whenever there was a mic set and singing and dancing in the hall, then Yudin would play his flute. It sounded lovely. Yet he couldn't even write an A or AA. People said they could not understand how he had learned to play the flute. Then, when an adult education scheme was started here, he went along with his slate in hand, and started learning to read and write. But his wife came rushing up in a great frenzy, shouting at him, and abusing him saying, Gee, shameless fellow. Now, when you are at your last gasp you want to start studying, do you? You are going to become some kind of collector or what? Now he's been dead for some seven or eight years. There's another man like that, known as Pig Pavulu. His real name is Pavulu. I don't know why they call him Pig Pavulu. Both he and his son can sing, and dance brilliantly. Once or twice they had brought a troop of women from Marudai and put on a dance performance with records. They had also put on plays. Pig Pavulu's son was a great prankster. One time, at Easter, when the icons were held at shoulder level and taken round in Saparam procession, the drummers were completely drunk and were stumbling about, scarcely able to play. At that point, this boy and four or five other youths joined together, plucked away the drum, the flute and the conch from the musicians, took over the music and walked in procession in front of the chariot. And he played even better than the professional drummer. Then there was Thavisipathia's son Pavulu. He was another who sang really well. Now he too had a group whom he accompanied on the village. Sometimes he would hold story and song villapata sessions by the bazaar. In fact, several people were excellent at dance and song and rhythm, though they didn't even have a whiff of learning. Some people beat out an accompanying rhythm to the songs by holding a wide-mouthed clay pot against their bellies and tapping on it with a small stone. It was really good to hear. You could do this with a clay pot and you could do it with a brass pot too. It sounded even more splendid when four or five people played in unison or against each other. They always swayed their heads according to the beat. You'd want to keep watching them forever. Even the little ones were good at singing and dancing. Even the bare-bottom toddlers would sing out, Sunjanaka Sunjanaka, as they strummed away on broken clay pots strung with cattle membrane, and they danced beautifully, never once losing the beat. Women too sang. As they planted out paddy seedlings, or weeded the fields, or harvested the grain, they worked to the rhythm of their songs. They sang to their babies as they rocked them in their cradles. They sang to the young girls when they came of age. They sang dirges to their dead. After the Easter Pasai was said in the church, the women stood in a circle and sang, he is coming through our street, he is coming through our street, Yesu is coming in his chariot. They would sing this and dance a kumi, clapping hands. It was only after they did this that the Saparam procession was taken around our parts.
They sang teasing songs to the prospective bride and groom who were usually cross cousins, as I was grinding the masala, Makanya peeped over the wall what magic powder did you cast upon me? I cannot lift the grinding stone anymore. At night, the young men went off to hunt in the mountain jungle with their hunting dogs. This was not just a pastime for them, though. Wild animals such as wild pigs and foxes often destroyed the crops in the fields. So they went to trap them. But they also set their dogs on wild rabbits and pigs and caught whatever they could find. Once they caught a porcupine and tied it to the lamppost in front of the community hall. That was the first time that I ever saw a porcupine. If they caught a wild pig, they would thrust it into the fire, burn off all its bristles, smear it with turmeric and wash it, decorate it with flowers, garland it tie. It high up in a bullock cart and take it from street to street. Adults and children, we'd all follow the cart. The man who caught and killed the pig would receive a new veshti and shoulder cloth. Once it was taken through all the streets, it would be butchered and the meat distributed to all the families. The entire village would be in high spirits that day. On one occasion they even managed to catch a deer. It was actually forbidden to kill deer or mountain goat. But if the forester was given a portion of the meat, he would turn a blind eye. Said so many people buy and eat beef on the quiet these days, it's getting more and more difficult for us to get any meat. All of them eat their fill, but see, it's only we people who are called low caste. It must have been about nine at night. Over the mic at the community hall, there came a loud announcement that there would be a cinema show the following night, in celebration of the new year. From the tiniest one, everyone was in a state of high excitement. They all waited impatiently for the hours to pass. The next morning, the whole street was astir, absolutely bustling with joy. Someone was calling out her wares in a sing-song voice and making good business, apples, oranges, grapes. What's this, I wondered as I went out to see, how is it that such expensive fruit is being sold along our street? Here, you with the oranges, come here, Amma. I was surprised to hear so many voices summoning the fruit seller eagerly. Mathama's son said, Amma, make sure you buy the fruit for the priest and for the mother superior at the same time. Then the daughter added, look Amma, the members of Our Lady Sabai have to make their gifts too, get enough for them as well. I understood what was going on only after that. At the start, of the new year, it was the custom for the entire congregation to go family by family, both to the mother superior and to the priest, carrying gifts of fruit or biscuits. They would garland the priest and the mother superior and pay their respects. I realized that this was still happening. Even though our people had never tasted the fruit themselves, they somehow went through every effort to buy the fruit for the church elders, they made their offering, knelt before them in all humility and received the sign of the cross on their foreheads. From our house too, we went to church carrying our gifts. On that day, because it was the new year, there was a long queue in front of the confession box. The Pasai began at 8 in the morning and concluded, one way or another, at half past 10. During the Pasai, there was only one man who sang out loudly, while quite a few others accompanied him by beating out the rhythm on all sorts of objects. Suddenly there was a voice from the women's side, there isn't a soul even to sing. Sing. The hymns. But there are ten fellows ready and willing to beat out the rhythm. Shameless fellows. When she said this loud and clear, there was a quick burst of laughter in the church. But some people went, sh. sh like a pack of snakes and told them to be quiet. At the very center of the church, just where the priest had sprinkled holy water and left, a small urchin was standing, completely naked. He then began walking along the grill, pissing as he went. Goodness knows whether he thought he was sprinkling holy water around, just as the priest had done. He was holding on to himself exactly, as if he was dribbling out column flour. A nun who saw him rose to her feet, went up to him, and gave him for sharp blows to his back. The boy couldn't stand the pain and screamed out, whereupon his mother yelled, it's New Year's Day, and he's only a baby, should you hit him as if he has committed some kind of heinous sin. And with this, she picked up the child and walked out of the church. When the Pasai was over, there was a huge crowd at the priest's house. Not only did each family come with their offering, but many groups such as the Our Lady Sabai, the Holy Childhood Sabai, the Good Death Sabai, and the soldiers of God brought their gifts, too. We too went along with the crowd, pushed our way ahead, made our offerings and came away. Whether we asked for it or not, the priest made the sign of the cross on every forehead, one after the other, upon those who knelt in front of him, and those who fell down in full prostration. One woman lamented, the priest who was here before this always gave us a couple of orange sweets, five or six holy pictures, and a new calendar when we came with our gifts. This one just puts a cross on us and tells us to go away. Everyone agreed with her, and they came away complaining about his miserliness. E.I. Aka, I asked the priest for a calendar, smiling sweetly. At him all the time. He actually asked me for money, Aka. He says he'll only sell them. Just see how the times have. Changed. Anthoniama laughed as she said this. At once the leader of the Our Lady Sabai scolded everyone. Very well, don't stand about showing your teeth. Let's go to the convent now. Our Sabai has to give Mother Superior her gifts. But it seems that the Reverend Mother also sent them away with the sign of the cross. Someone had asked her, Reverend Mother, please give us at least a holy picture. And the Mother Superior had said, 
Have you given me some money in order to buy you holy pictures? Very well, now, you may all go home quickly without leaning on the walls or touching anything. Later, she summoned the leader of the sabai and carefully counted out just enough small drawstring cloth bags, so that only those who had gone to see her that morning would receive one each. Later on there was a rumpus over this very thing. Children of whores, couldn't you have brought a bag for me too? Haven't I paid my seven rupees for the presentation? Just like everyone else. All those others who never paid their fair share have gone and got drawstring bags, the wretches. Tyrus Olivamaka was shouting loud enough to make the whole street resound. Anyway, after that everyone took their share of meat, cooked and ate it, and then waited eagerly for the evening cinema show. By seven in the evening, there was a huge crowd at the community hall. Schoolboys went along the street ringing a bell and announcing that the priest would be giving a special blessing at the church because of the new year. But not a soul went, for who would miss the picture and go to the blessing instead? The gossip was that the village Nadamai had hired the video recorder and deck, and that there would be three shows going on throughout the night. Anthoniyama from next door came and told us, Periyama, they say there will be three shows on at different places. There will be a Rajnikant film at the Shrine of St. Sebastian, a Kamal Hassan film at the Shrine of St. Anthony, and an MGR film at the Shrine of St. Ignatius. Somehow or the other I have to see all three. Oh, why didn't they put on a Savaji Ganesan film as well? And she ran off to the community hall like the wind. But even after ten at night, neither the equipment nor the films had arrived. The people who had been waiting for so long were desperately disappointed. It looked as if it was going to drizzle, besides. Nevertheless, everyone sat there in front of the dais, as if they had been nailed to the ground, praying to St. Sebastian intermittently to hold off the rain. Then Chin Nappin said, well, what if we can't get the video equipment? Why can't we bring out Chittapa teacher's TV and show the picture in that? How can we show a picture on someone's home TV da? In that TV you can only see whatever is being transmitted from the stations. It was Thomas who said this. Then Kalkundan who was sitting in the crowd explained as best. As he could. Say this TV is like your hand radio. If you put. In a tape and watch a video film, it's like using your radio like a tape recorder. But if you turn the knobs on a radio you can only listen to whatever is being broadcast through it. It's just like that. You turn the knob on the TV, and then you can watch only what is being transmitted. But with a video, you can push in whatever picture you like and watch that. Although it was past eleven, the cinema show had not arrived, so the crowds began to dissolve and people went away home. Then all of a sudden there was an announcement over the mic, that although the proper equipment had not arrived, they would show the film on a makeshift screen. Again people ran as fast as they could to find a decent spot in the community hall. In front of the dais, two poles had been planted upon which a white screen was fixed. E.I. Sevathi Aka, they are setting up a screen show, it's going to be an MGR picture, come soon, Amalorpavam called out, running as she went. E.I. Cousin by Kundam, what's the picture? Who's acting? It's Kudi Arunda Coil, the temple they lived in. MGR and that lady, Jailalata, act in it. Everyone was delighted when. That young man gave out this information. At last the cinema show began at about 12. Everyone shut up and there was silence. Before they showed the main film there was a small sequence showing MGR's beer being carried along the streets after he died. The audience joined in with sympathetic noises. After the long wait, everyone watched the scene, wholly absorbed by the tragedy. And at last, after all this, the film Kudi Arunda Coil began. The next morning, I asked a few people what yesterday's film had been like. Oh, didn't you come? Oh, what a fine picture it was. MGR played two roles. You should have seen how well Jailalata acted. I can't tell you how beautiful she is. You know that bit where they sing together. You know when they sing, I tell you again not to go there, you must not go, and the father comes and drives them away. I had to go to the toilet just then, I couldn't hold out any longer. I had to go and miss just that bit. Then she said that a certain Nambir, or someone with a similar name, made his appearance after that. He apparently turns up in many films, always playing a similar role as the villain. In this film he has a daughter who strips off and dances about in that state. She doesn't seem to have any shame, Akka. But how can whores like that feel any shame? And so people set off on their different tasks, commenting on the film they had seen. At Christmas, Easter and New Year's Day, people hang up posters of Rajnikant and Kamal Hassan here and there. Nobody seems to know what the festival is really about, or what it is celebrating. Different fan clubs will hang up these pictures during their competitions. They will set up loudspeakers in four or five different places, and broadcast songs which seem to wail and scream through the air. These are the pastimes of today. Now, besides, there is a cinema of our own in our parts. People go and watch films there, every now and then. In the old days, the more educated of the young people would put on plays. Now you don't see any of that. They all go about having learned a few things in a half-hearted way. In their spare time, the old folk play games such as a duckily, a chess-like board game with three pieces as tigers and twelve pieces as sheep, or they play cards. Many drink toddy or eric and get into quarrels and fights.